Good morning. Hello and Namaskar to the chairman, the co-chairman and the rest of the chair. And yes, yes, to the vice chancellor of the university. It's amazing to see uh, and that it uh, working the way it does. And uh, the way he has organized this along with uh, the dean of the college is uh, not only praiseworthy, but is one to emulate uh, for the young people who are in here uh, to see that how conferences need to be done. And a kudos to you. Thank you. I'm very really pleased to be in here for several reasons. First is that uh, during the last two years, two and a half now, it has been an uh, era of uh, despair and has been an era of hope. Tomorrow will be a better day. It has been an era of disappointment, but it has been an era of pleasure. The pleasure that it gave us an extra edge to do something which we have not been doing at all. And it has been an era in which that uh, uh, one had to sit in front of the computer. And during the last two years, I think that more than about 38 or 39 lectures uh, on computer I had to give, which is, uh, and on different varieties, which kept me all the time busy in preparing and finding out that what is the new in the subject. And therefore, was also a source of learning these years. And pleasure because today, it's after two years, that is that you provided an opportunity to some of us to be face to face. And here I am today face to face with the, uh, with the galaxy of people around there, especially the people who are working in the area of reproduction in the area of buffalo production, management, health, and the associated areas. Today, in the morning session, that uh, the speakers uh, obliquely said all what was to be said as an introduction to a program like the one which has been organized today. And I'm thankful to uh, the brief introductions which were provided. And in fact, that summed up some of the things which need to be elaborated now. During the next few, which I will share with you, that I will be able to take you over onto those aspects which have found focus and those aspects which need focus as far as the buffalo development is concerned. The specific topic which has been assigned was in terms of interventions which are sustainable and those interventions which come for buffalo to transform this animal in terms of its productivity. That was the topic and I intend to topic this discussion on the small four headings in which I'll be talking on this, what we talk of this animal transformation. I will try to bring about the sustainability of buffalo production, and then go over to the challenges, and finally talk of the interventions which have been made in order to be explicit in terms of what I have to say. Oh, there is a lovely buffalo in front of me. This lovely animal of ours, I had not met and I had not seen till about the 14 and a half years, 15 years of my life. The first time I saw this animal was under very dramatic circumstances. Uh, we had been picked up by the state government as a team for cricket. 
to come and play in Punjab. And that was say in the year 1954. And as a young college FSC student, I accompanied the team, but the travel was very interesting because each one of us team member was put in a separate truck. So this was a convoy of trucks which carried the team to up to Jammu. From Jammu, a, a rickety bus was given to us with a driver who had not gone into Punjab ever. So that this will go and take us to, um, to Sharpur, then to um, Jalandhar, then Ludhiana and Abala. That's where our engagement spectacular was. And we started very healthily and we came over up to a place called Urmur Tanda, where we were supposed to have the first match. And this Turmur Tanda had a principal of the college who was a former cricketer. So he had organized this, uh, that there will be a good match. We were on the, about it was afternoon, we were on the way to reach that place after having sat in a metabolic shaker that best was for about uh, seven hours. And lo and behold, that our this driver did not know how to drive on these roads, especially when a buffalo is in front of you. He thought by the time he reaches that point, the buffalo will have crossed over. But unfortunately, buffalo did not cross over and then he banked into the buffalo and buffalo was down on ground. And we out of the bus and a lot of people surrounded there. And I could see a gash on the, the rump and then this was prostrate. And so every one of us was wondering what to do. We were scared because the people had come around and this buffalo was uh, down with her eyes open. And suddenly a person with a lati came in and picked up the tail of this buffalo, twisted it hard and up the buffalo went. Probably that time gave me an idea that you can twist the tail to get your things to it. <laughs> but unfortunately, human beings do not have a tail. Late Fletcher used to say that if you want to set a person right, develop a tail for him first and then twist it. <laughs> this is not a problem. Late Fletcher used to say. But that was the time when I met Buffalo for the first time because even if we have animals in our home, but we didn't, we hold in the state, there were hardly any buffaloes. Friends, that love at first meeting subsequently turned into more closer when I went to the Punjab College of Veterinary Science at Isar. And then where we have to be continuously because it was the buffalo cases were handled. And we really learned how to handle this, this large animal. And since then, this animal has stuck with me and I have stuck with him. So to begin with, I have to give my salutations to this animal because all what I am and where I am and how I have progressed is all because of this buffalo. And as a matter of fact, about uh, 15 days back, one of my students uh, was uh, trying to figure out these, trying to categorize the publications. I found that about uh, uh, 227 publications in the international and national journals have been only on buffalo. Which means that we have been associating ourselves with a vast array of subjects where we are connected with buffalo. Friends, what are we really talking about? We are talking about the excellence in buffalo. Unfortunately, you take any paper published till about uh, early uh, 2000, that uh, which you see that it will learn the buffalo has got inherently the problems. So it will talk of finding problems in buffalo, not the niceties in buffalo. So with a di difference, I thought to bring in front of you that what is the excellence in this area. As of today, in this subcontinent, where we call the home of the buffalo, there is no better animal. There is no lactating dairy animal. And there is no better companion of a farmer than buffalo. And I hope that you have already gone through the reasons for a uh, preview of time. 
that I will let you do the reading and also the listening part of it. But two things, I will talk of this. One is the niche production system. More from less. I think this hasn't highlighted, this has not been highlighted so far. More from less is that when you talk the yields which come from the buffalo, they outscore all other animals. That is one of the major aspects of the profitability which comes from the Senate. And its acceptance today across the country and even in the global scene is because of this is a net profitable animal and this profitability is from less input than you have to give to the corresponding production system. And let's look into the perspective in which that we are today talking of buffalo. This sector to which we call the buffalo sector in this country, in the livestock, is highly dynamic. I had occasion to be associated with uh, the field program during the time I was a member of the Farmers Commission. And in that, that we traveled to different states, especially in North India. And then in that process that I discovered that this is a highly dynamic animal. Because dynamism does not come if you are excellent in one thing. Dynamism comes that if you can deliver on different fronts. And that's what this animal delivers. Then today, the perspective is that it is increasing in demand. Demand not in terms of its product, but demand in terms of rearing. And we know that right from north to the south now, that the population of buffaloes is increasing. And if you take the uh, these statistics, which is available from us with us today, that we find that about uh, one to four percent increase in the total buffalo population. And in some states, it's as much as six to 10 percent increase in buffalo population. Of course, that there is increased profitability and the animal numbers, which we see that it is yielding in numbers are less, it is yielding more. Uh, people referred that in the morning, that how we see that there is 45% to 55% of milk over years. Today, it's about 56% of total milk produced in the country comes from buffalo, 103 million buffaloes out of which about 65 million are lactating ones, or what we call it Mitchell animals, compared to another 200 animals that out of which also that we are having the same number of lactating animals but the productivity out of them is not the same as the buffalo. We need to see that the technological interventions are available today. Several technological in interventions are available. But for that, we need the knowledge and skill to be delivered. And therefore, that we need strategies as a perspective by which we'll be undoing what people say the livestock is trying to do, and that is uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. So therefore, there are these challenges. And the challenge, the first and the foremost challenges, which I have been fighting for, as a matter of fact, I have gone to several forums, to the institutes, and requested that let us give a brand to our buffalo. <clears throat> We never talk of buffalo as a brand. We say milk, we don't say buffalo milk. We say meat, we don't say as buffalo meat as such. We don't call the products as buffalo products. The very fact is that anytime and we talk of pricing of milk, which uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Trevi, I have been corresponding with him, it's a very important issue. That we say that milk, milk price. We talk two excesses, formulas, we talk different formulas, but the net effect is that the buffalo gets neglected. So the first thing, and I think, if any single thing gets passed and recommended from this house, is that we should say that buffalo is a brand and follow it as a brand. And then 
competition between food and feed. This is a perspective, very important perspective. The food and the feed. There is not an animal which is capable of deliver us except for small ruminants, the large ruminants, the food and the feed. So that is another aspect. That's a challenge to take us up. The quality assertion and dissemination of superior germ plasm. This is, this is the important issue, which is that what is the better germ plasm for buffaloes? Any male bull earlier used to, any male used to be a bull and the bull used to be with semen. Then we had the All India Coordinated Program and very really good work was done and then Ludhiana, at the time the Animal Science College has one of the, one of the best setups for that. And under that setup, we could see and bring out that there were certain bulls who had greater efficiency of transmitting their abilities. Something is a problem. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Then the other challenge which has come out is then the security, biosecurity, particularly which concerns the human health. And today, when we are going over to the international market, whether you talk of meat or you talk of milk, that we are forced to speak about traceability. Even those smaller countries where we used to find our access very easy, especially in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, where most of our meat used to go, that they are also now today talking of the traceability. So this is a big challenge for us. We are slaughtering a lot of, we have what, very good slaughterhouses now in some parts of the country. But now that issue, traceability has to be answered. We also have to have human health concerns. And we need to have the infrastructure, the finances, and the trained manpower. Unfortunately, we never train our professionals to buffalo production. We talked about the veterinary science. And in the veterinary science, we see as a colloquial science in which we have to talk about several species. But there was never a course that which would say that is is specializing in buffalo. It's time now. Because we see that the future, as of today, in terms of the livestock production in the country, is exclusive with the buffalo. And so, therefore, that we need to make certain exclusive programs, certain exclusive capsules, and particularly the coming back over into the schools to learn more about buffalo. And we should be ready with new things to be told, the content to be developed for such programs to exclusively address ourselves to buffalo. And the last, which I will say among the challenges is that we have to have an efficient delivery system of our science. One thing which is missing with us as a professional veterinarian, somebody said about 27 years, it's almost about 60 years. As a matter of fact, I graduated in 1960. It's almost 60 years that I have been with this profession. And it has been my pleasure to be associated with this profession. And all what I have got is out of this profession. But still, I see that the delivery of it to reach to the end user, that system is not being getting bridged. We have made attempts in that direction. I could see the, one of the seminars, webinars, which we had held, uh, the vice chancellor of this university uh, participated in that, Dr. Indarji. And I was so glad that he pointed out specifically this thing in that seminar. That is the delivery system where we have to reach the farmer, we have to reach the unreached. And that is what is very critical. And now for buffalo production, it becomes much more important because this is a very valuable animal. What happened? Somebody did a magic that it's not to go forward. I was doing it from here. Yeah, here it is. Now, what is the state of this animal agriculture, what I'm talking of? Uh, this is important to be understood. 
because uh, there are different opinions which are being expressed with respect to the livestock production in the country. And we're really in crossroads as far as the agriculture is concerned. And that's what has led to the transformation in agriculture. Today, we have got about record of about 308 million tons of food grains. And these food grains is so much that it fills our granaries and we are not able to utilize it. To the extent that about 38 million tons of food grains get wasted anyway, because we don't have a storage. Now this is one side of the picture. At the other side that we have got hunger and poverty in the country. We have the food, but we have the hunger. Now this is a great disparity. Now how does this happen? Because this food which is being produced does not reach the end user. And where the end user, where this poverty and where this uh, difficulty for the nursing mothers and the growing children and the young uh, adolescent uh, population is that they are not getting the proper amount of nutrition. So we are having on under the canopy of our vast agricultural production that we are having same time and situation of malnutrition and malnutrition. So it is here that the animal science fits over into this. As a matter of fact, that you will find that when we talk of more production from the soil, that and we are not putting in the natural amount of uh, fertilizer over pages. What is happening is something which you see in the curve here. There is a declining fertilizer response ratio. Even if you, that's what we talk of soil degradation. I don't know whether Dr. Gurbachan is here or not, but that, uh, this is what I have been discussing with him, that over periods of time there is soil depression. The Punjab Agricultural University differs with me in some aspects of there. I had a dialogue with Dr. Baldev, and he has sent me certain figures of it to show that what's, uh, what's there in the field. But then these are also the pictures which I have shown you is the state of Haryana and Punjab, along with the Western UP, that where we are seeing this decline in crash. And then where will this protein and nutrients come? When we have got an agricultural system, it comes only from pulses. And for about two decades, in spite of all efforts, that our pulses production was 13 to 14 million tons, which subsequently, about three years back, jumped to about 24 million tons, and we are around there. But last two years, again, we had a dip. So the question is not only of, of protein, but it is the total nutrients. And this is what is very important as far as the uh, state of agriculture is concerned. Therefore, that on, the, on this sand, that we see that the agricultural growth annually, except for these two years, last two years, which have good rain, it came down about four and a half, six percent. Over a whole decade, we had a growth rate of only 2.2 percent in agriculture and negative for some years. But when we talk of the total agriculture in that, relieving the crops aside, that it used to come positive because of the contribution that come, used to come from the livestock. And livestock has been growing continuously at 4.5. This is not by the order of the God that livestock has to perform this much. No, this is because the efforts which the farmer puts in, this is the efforts which you were veterinarians put in. And greatest of them, it is because of the capability of the animals with which we are working whether it's a sheep or goat. And the greatest model which we are presenting to the whole world, in which that I can go into any podium and speak to this, the uniqueness of our production system is that this milk, which is which we are talking of, on some eight million tons of milk, is not produced from concentrates. It's a very small amount of concentrates, 11 to 12 million tons of capacity. And some concentrates which are distributed over in the cooperative systems. Most of our production, whether it is meat from sheep, wheat from goats, meat from buffaloes, it is from non-grain sources. And that's what we keep take. Why is it that the buffalo meat prefers the world over, India buffalo meat? is because of the quality of the meat, because the less fat which is in the meat. And that's what the, the superiority which comes in the land. And that is where we are talking of uh, a transformation which is taking place. 
transformation is also taking place because of the allocation of uh, resources. Agricultural resources and livestock resources, about which uh, in their made a statement in the morning, that I want to go a little further. I want to say that those states where the contributions from livestock is more, the poverty is least. And therefore, that this is livestock, this production, this transformation which I am talking of is because of livestock now taking over. In Haryana, for instance, that it was at one time only 27 contribution. Today, it is 42 percent. In Punjab, it has crossed 40. And these are the prosperous states where the poverty is limited. On the other hand, those states where the contributions is very low, Bihar suddenly picked up two years up and they went over onto a production contribution of over 50%. And therefore, they thought that we will be able to get over the limit of uh, poverty. And that's what I'm saying that this transformation which is taking place this is exactly a transition where the agricultural production and the livestock production is taking place and leading the transformation. And I need here to bring to focus that this is taking place when we talk of this buffalo as a specific animal. And in that, we can see that among the buffaloes also, that it is the one breed, one group of animals, which is called the Mora and Mora type, because there are several Mora types, not only in India, but globally. In Argentina, there are Mora, when you see them, they are looking definitely Mora. In Brazil, they are looking Mora, and they are Mora types. But what is them that there is also a non-descript group of buffaloes, which should be our attention today. Two and a half to four liters of milk, and get them onto Mura about seven liters of milk. And that is the immediate task before us. Besides an animal, which is so beautiful animal to look at, in Jafrabad, the uh, buffaloes, especially the males, when I saw in Argentina, I was confusing whether it's an elephant or it's a buffalo. With, with a huge body mass, almost comparing to an elephant, because they have that is the feeding system which gets involved. In the but our feeding system is different. But Jaffa Badi recorded 14 liters of milk, buffalo. Recorded. So, what we need? We need our Murrah to go up. If not to that level, at least we need to take and not only this. Uh, about 36 and 38 liters of milk, but to go to about 50 and 55 and liters of milk. Prosperous animals, for instance, today has recorded as much as the world space, about 70 liters of milk in our country. But what we need to do is with the buffalo to address it specifically. And we talk of this, what we say as the graded animal, where the importance is there. In comparison with this, when we talk of the cattle, I need to just say a minute that we have got a large number of breeds. But the most of the animals, as you can see this, about 74% are non disturbed And it is here where the attention has to go. I understand, but I have to go a few minutes more. So we are therefore referring to this from transition to transformation. So one, we are having the sense that the transformation and it is taking place uh, as I said, the contributions are going as much as 47%. Uh, Globally, the contributions of livestock are increasing and it may not be long before we hear that has cost 50% in livestock. Uh, if we talk in terms of the numbers, therefore, it becomes important that the population of the total exotic and prospered animals increased by 26% by about 2019. But there is a decline. But here we find about 1% increase in our uh, buffalo population. And then also we must understand that agriculture crop production leaves millions hungry and the country has further slipped into the hungry hunger standards. Livestock contribution to the GDP growth is controlling nearly 50% of GDP in some states. The transition is leading to agriculture to a major transformation. And I had pleasure of having some data from this university itself. 
just to illustrate a, a, a point, uh, if you remember that I had requested for this data, and this came and this is uh, the productivity trends in buffalo, crossbred cattle, and indigenous cattle. Because often this is said that uh, uh, whether buffalo is profitable or a crossbred animal is profitable or a cow is profitable. And the whole time uh, production was compared. And we see that in here, when we talk of the end value of animals and the net income, you can see the net income coming from a buffalo and coming from a crossbred animal. I think this is also a lesson we need to learn about. But when we come to the crux of production, in the case of uh, buffaloes, this production is centered towards one thing, and that is the estrus, the estrus cycle, and in the estrus cycle, the estrus. Everything boils down to this estrus. Because if you talk the maturity, puberty, you talk of uh, animals getting pregnant, you talk of animals having a gestation period and then a uh, uh, freshening period, that was intercarbon period, everything goes down onto this, uh, what we say as the estrus. And the interplay of the mechanical events and the endocrine events, which are taking place incident to this act of food. It was this act which probably was my first concern with buffalo. As a matter of fact, for masters in 1965, that when I worked for this, I tried to find out that what is the ovulation time in an animal. We had no record of it. We try, I tried with buffaloes and I tried with cattle. And this was by palpation every three hours and find out what is the ovulation time. Subsequently, that I had a better tools in my hand. Subsequently, once I returned back to the country after my doctorate, I developed assay systems. And these assay systems were unique for us because as you see this, for 14 hormones, we developed assay systems using the radio <laughs> <laughs> and produce the materials for that, did our own eye donations, produced antibodies for that, and then evaluated that what happens over the, at this particular event in the case of estrus. At what phase does the LH come in? And at what phase does the XP, behavioral estrus come? And if you see over in there that uh, not only these, but we modified it subsequently over to an enzyme immunosystem, system, of which that they're all published uh, in our names. Uh, from our laboratories, that again, that a large number of these hormones were estimated by us, and especially for buffalo, till which the earlier I used to hear about the buffalo and technology was from Dr. Janaki Raman, who had started about it, but that was very limited. And in some of these work associated with the production of semen and the seasonal production, where we had also the hormones as well as season, I remember uh, one uh, work in which Dr. Donda was associated with in the publications of seasonal effect on buffalo semen. That was also in late 70s. Friends, from this, what is this word? I quickly, quickly take forward to you that here is a picture which illustrates to you that when we see that animals behaving in terms of natural way in this ovulation, this ovulation, as you see these arrows, are the ovulation relation to LH in different animals. But if we time this through exogenous intervention, that we find a unique thing happening, that you find these ovulations will come all together. And that's what is the basis of the intervention which we call as synchronization. Along with this, we have then developed a further in synchronization schedules in which that we are using GNRH, in which that there is using the prostaglandins and GNRH, some are using estradiol, but the synchro uh, mate uh, assays which we did and through which we went over into the field and did it under rural field conditions and found out that how those animals which were previously supposed to be uh, non-breeding, came into uh, cycle state and had a calf in a given period of time. 
Therefore, that we had several of these reproductive technologies, which we thought as art, artificial reproductive technologies, which got over in our way. And I hope we have talked from time to time, and maybe some of these I will be quite quickly speaking to you. One is this embryo transfer technology, and that in which that uh, we had several benefits of it. It had several components, but the important thing is that this is this uh, uh, embryo transfer technology that what was that we could multiply a female very fast. As many as 10 calves we could produce from a female in a year's time. Of course, she didn't give birth to any one of them, but they were taken and produced from them. So we have the limitation, we, we have the dimensions which we touched over in this animal, a single crossbred animal with this seven number class. And enabled us, for example, through exogenous, <coughs> The exploitation of this technology to increase number of births, to increase the milk meat wool production, because it was used extensively by my student Nakvi, Dr. Nakvi at uh, Sheep and Goat Research Institute, where he also took out this to on the field and did this multiplication and oestrus synchronization under field conditions. So there is a economy and economics modeling using these technologies. However, the technology has further gone over into this. That what we see now today, our we have to design it. We are at a say we, we need a designer. We have now got the designer technologies. We can play with body parts and we can play with body function. We can have the genetic, anatomical, and physiological mean of, uh, manipulation. As a matter of fact, earlier all reproduction, all production used to be tied to a genotype. But today the time has come. And we are going a phenotype to a gene. We are introducing a type of phenotype which is supposed to give us a further genotype. And that is what we call a sustainable intervention. And for sustainable intervention, I say the G cube or G3. What does the G3 mean? It means the gamete, the genetics, and the growth. These are the three major components of which we were talk of modern day improvement and in interventions. And these are the fundamentals to the interventions uh, for production through reproduction. And uh, there are several of these uh, which are available today that uh, genomic interventions, and they were, I have listed over it here with the references that uh, we're talking of trade that will increase muscle growth, orderliness, then we're talking of sterility, we're talking of uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis resistance and xenoplastation and things like that, in which uh, that we're talking about the genomic approaches. And we are also at that time being alarmed that when we are going to genotype, that we might be producing a completely inbred population. I just wanted to take this slide to you to convince of this fact, that this is a slide where which says that what trait is lost. There is an... Yes, you see that in a, in a survey in the United States, a single dairy cow produced about 3,000 liters of milk in a year. And today it is producing about 10,000 liters. And the prize winning about 26,000 liters is about 80 liters every day. Now, it is just two Y chromosomes exist in huge, in all of the populations of United States. Just two Y chromosomes. This is a strong selection, which has gone over in there because of the fact that everything now, no bull is without having gone through the ET and nominated mating with the best of the females. I need therefore to say the recent developments in prediction of bull fertility is based on assessment at molecular, cellular, and whole animal levels. And that's where the bull fertility becomes a very important issue. And it is not only a single factor. The bull fertility should not be taken in terms of the quality of semen, but in terms of the genetics quality of the semen also. The other Indian mentioned is in terms of the IVF. Of course, it was mentioned in the morning also. We had the world's first IVF that it was in 91, uh, which was produced over and over. From that, there have been several births of IVFs. 
not only in here, but subsequently in the cloning processes where I, IVF is involved, that there has been at the farmer's store also, that the people at saw did it at the farmer's store using an IVF technology for cloning process. Uh, still for that intervention, uh, about 1960, uh, 59, 69, it was man uh, who said that a small step for man, man and a giant leap for mankind. And that was Armstrong saying at the, at the surface of the moon. But today there is, since then, there was no giant leap in science, but a giant leap has taken now that then we have got a scissor, what we call as the CRISPR cost technology. And through this, we can now go over into a single base and on the basis of that uh, produce an, uh, uh, genetic alterations, which is uh, which gives the effectiveness to a particular expression of a gene. And through this, we have nanotechnologies. We have what, for example, you put the more muscle into it, that you can take rid of the horns, uh, these uh, horns, you can get over to the sheep, getting rid of uh, pigs, getting rid of smell, and things like that. And therefore, today, when we are talking of the scenario, it's important that we need to go to the interventions and this uh, interventions with the embryonic stem cells is another very important area in which that uh, this uh, embryonic stem cells have become very important. Today we are having young ones produced, not from the gamete, what I earlier said, but today young ones are produced from the air cell. The young ones are produced not from the gametic cell, but from a somatic cell or for that matter, an embryonic stem cell. And here it is, the demonstration to you, also about which I'm sure that uh, the people from uh, SR will be talking to you, that where there are 10 calves being born uh, through the cloning system from uh, one period, as a matter of seven from one period and four from another period. I need to say uh, towards the end, Pardon? Next speakers can come with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I need to we, say we, in the end, two things. Just two things. One is uh, that uh, this uh, buffalo order can also serve as uh, serve to us in terms of a great source of producing valuable proteins. And then there is uh, interventions in feed and fodder biotech and interventions through nano tech applications in where we are using biosensors, we are talking of nanosensors particles, we are talking of nanoparticles in terms of, and we are talking of nanomotors or sperms to make their entry. But these are all things, and we are today also talking of health, individual health of an embryo. That means single embryo health is being traced or to find out that how will the sperm go using the science of omics, the metabolomics, and also the imaging. Friends, uh, I would like to address myself to the major animal production and health interventions, which have been with us and which have been have done, and you can see them, they are listed in here yeah, I have talked. I think that if we are able to mix these with a controlled health system, with a better feeding system, we are out to get an 30 to 40 percent increase in buffalo productivity in days and years to come. And I'm thankful to you. Today happens to be the month of December, and we are going ahead through the month of January 2020. So I take this pleasure in wishing you in advance uh, 2020. Yes. And Thank you very much, sir. We wish that you would have kept it on, but we have to honor the time. And, uh, Speakers. Thank you very much for sharing your very valuable ideas and thoughts. Thank you. Let's give a video call.